Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. It's good to have you with us today. Hope you've grabbed a handout and are looking it over, being familiar with the different things that are going on here. Spanish for one program note that this week, our midweek Bible class, our Wednesday night classes will be moved to Tuesday night because of the holiday. And so uh, please make note of that. We'll have all our regular classes, the kids' classes and adult classes alike. Uh, they'll just take place this Tuesday evening, 6.30, uh, instead of on Wednesday. So please uh, make note of that. Some of the other things that are happening are listed in there. Uh, so be aware of those things as well. We uh, want to announce this morning that Johnny and Sherry Irby uh, want to be identified with uh, the church here at Spanish Fort. They've attended here for quite some time, and we've all, as we told them, uh, we already considered you identified with the church here, but we'll make it official this morning if you guys will stand, and that way we can recognize you. Thank you. Also this morning, uh, the elders would like to put before the congregation the names of four men that we have spoken to and talked to about serving in the role of deacons. Uh, these four men will join our other four deacons. Uh, we will put these names up for two weeks, and if you have any uh, scriptural concerns as to why these men cannot serve, uh, we would like for you to... Uh, Present those to the elders either in writing or email, and uh, we will not entertain any anonymous uh, uh, responses, so please sign your name to those if you do have any concerns there. Uh, we would like for you to consider uh, John Crook uh, as a deacon. Uh, John will be primarily working and has been working in the area of uh, our building and grounds and maintenance. Uh, with that, along with uh, John, we're putting up uh, John Davis. Uh, John has also been working with John Crook already in this area. You know, for a number of years, Phil Williams did an incredible job of working with our building and grounds. And over the last uh, several months, uh, John and John, sounds like a law firm or something, but John, John and John have been working together. And uh, this is a huge task with the, the size facility that we have. And so these two men have agreed to serve in the capacity of deacons. And so we want you to consider them. Also, Tim Crowley. Uh, Tim will primarily be dealing with our uh, benevolence. Of course, you know, Lindsay works with that some. And so Tim will uh, help and assist in that as being a deacon over our uh, benevolence work. And also Sidney Grisham. Uh, Sydney will be uh, overseeing our seniors uh, ministry uh, as we talk to him it seems like the church always takes care of the kids it takes care of the teens and the young adults do a great job among themselves but sometimes when you get to be 60 or above you're just kind of left on your own and so we don't like that and we want to we want to we wanna create an opportunity for for some activities and some stuff to uh, take place for our seniors group and so Sydney has graciously uh, accepted the uh, uh, offer that we've made to him to be a deacon over that. So these four men we present to you is uh, to serve in this capacity and hope that you will be prayerful in your consideration of them. And, and, and there's no scriptural objection as to why they should not serve in a couple of weeks. We will, we will make that official. This morning we're here to worship God. We're here to praise him and to lift him up. So I hope that you're ready to do that. Keith's ready to lead us. So let's be standing as we praise him. Mm -hmm. oh,
Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 11. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds up upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that is which laid, which is Jesus Christ.
Let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Holy God, our Heavenly Father, so joyful we are that we can come this day to, to worship you. And Father, help us as we worship you that we will truly honor you, give glory to you and, and glory to your Son. Father, we're so thankful for the love that you had for us, that you gave your Son, for the love that he had for us, that he would go to that cruel cross and give his life there in a sacrifice for us that his blood would cleanse us of our sins, and that would prepare us a way that we could be with you for eternity. Father, we indeed thank you for uh, the blessing of coming together, the ability to sing these songs of praise to you, and may our songs of praise be pleasing unto you. Father, be with us as we pray to you. Be with us, Father, as we listen and open up our hearts and our minds to the word that we'll will bring to us. Father, help us to truly open our hearts to, to the message of your word and what it holds for us and what it can do for us as we strive to, to be children of yours. Father, help us to encourage one another as we come together. Help us to encourage and be encouraged. Father, help us to, to truly brother, be brothers and sisters and love one another as you have loved us. Father, we're thankful for uh, our abilities that you give us. And Father, we ask that you would be with those that are struggling at this time, whether it be sickness or heartache of, of loss of the loved ones or just the troubles of life. Father, we would ask that you would be with us as uh, that we can help those and those that are in these situations can look to you for comfort, for guidance that only you can give in this world. Father, we ask you to be with the leaders of our country Help them to rule in such a way that our freedom to worship you might always exist. Father, we're thankful for the leaders of this congregation, our shepherds and our ministers. Help them, Father, and give them knowledge and wisdom to uh, proclaim your word, to keep us unified and, and bring one another together. Father, we're thankful for uh, the day that you've given us, the opportunities of this day. We thank you for life itself and for the many opportunities that you give us. Father, help us to, you, to give those, to use those things that you give us to, to glorify you and to show the love that you have for us. Father, be with us in all things. In it's Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. next song has four stanzas, and I would ask you to uh, note the second stanza, which has reference to uh, the Lord's table of communion service, which we're shortly about to participate in, and the rest of it is praising God for that. So having noted that, let's sing this song. Mm.
You know, I hope you take some time this week to offer thanksgiving for the things in your life that you're thankful for. And, you know, every time I think as, as I get older, the holidays, and especially this time of year, mean something a little different to me. You know, I remember as a kid, Thanksgiving was a time where we came together as a family. I saw other family members that I was only going to see one time a year, and that was on Thanksgiving morning or afternoon, and that excited me. I enjoyed that. And as you get older, maybe you start thinking about the, the physical things in your life. If you're a parent, your children, the home that you're able to provide. If you're a grandparent, your grandchildren, the family that you've established. So I think as you go through different phases, this time of year can mean different things. But I want to point out to you in 2 Corinthians what Paul says that you, Christian, and me, Christian, should be thankful for. And beginning in verse 7, he says, but... We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. And struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken since we have the same spirit of faith. We also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself all of this is for your benefit so that grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God therefore we do not lose heart though hourly we are wasting away yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. As you offer thanks this week, and as you think about everything in your life you're thankful for, look past the physical. And remember what you as a Christian and what I as a Christian need to be thankful for first and foremost. And that is simply the cross. And that is Jesus. That's his life. That's his death. That's his burial his resurrection the power shown through that and what Paul says this is your treasure it is an all-surpassing power and that even though you may be hard-pressed you're not crushed and even though you're perplexed you're not in despair you may be persecuted but you're not abandoned you may be struck down but certainly not destroyed and when you go through these things it is all because It is all for your benefit to show the power of God's grace through the resurrection of Christ. Outwardly could be a struggle, but inwardly you're renewed. All because of the the eternal glory that you have that far outweighs everything. Would you bow with me please? Father, we're thankful. And we're thankful to you for all that we have. And so many times, God, we... We focus on the physical when we say thank you, God, but man, we are, we are so thankful for Christ. We're thankful for you loving us enough to send him, for him coming, being humbled from his throne of glory to walk as we walk, to be tempted as we're tempted, God, and yet to remain perfect. As we partake of this bread, which represents his body, God, help us to focus on All that you've given to us, God, but help us to to focus on where our gratitude should be for this gift, for this free gift that we did nothing to deserve. Help us to send our hearts and minds on the cross as we partake of this bread. In Christ's name, amen.
bow with me again? Father, we offer prayer thanksgiving and praise to you, God, for not only for the body of Christ, Father, but for the blood that was shed. Father, that blood that, that cleanses us from our sins. And Father, not only for just a sacrifice, God, but for the death and, and the power shown through the resurrection, God, that, that offers that eternal hope that we have. Um, that you're going to do what you said you're going to do, and that's raise us up, Father, in his presence, in his glory, Father, to be presented to you. And we're so thankful for that, and we're so grateful um, for the sacrifice of Christ, Father. As we partake of this cup, representing that blood, help us to center our hearts and minds on that cross, Father, and be thankful for him and his resurrection. In Christ's name, amen. This, um, this concludes the Lord's Supper, and you know, I guess the challenge to myself that I hope maybe you get something out of is to be thankful for more than just the physical, but you know, we've also got a lot of physical to be thankful for, don't we? There's a lot in our lives that God's given us that we don't deserve, that we haven't earned, that, that really is His, and now is a great opportunity uh, to give back just such a small portion that, that shows your heart of gratitude, that shows an opportunity to be thankful for everything in your life. Would you bow with me? Father, we are thankful for, for everything spiritual that you've given to us, God, but this time we, we're also thankful for the physical, God, and, and, and here on earth for especially the, the monetary value and things that you've given us, God. And as we just take a moment just to give back such a small portion of what you've given to us, God, help us to do so with, with our hearts in the right place, Father. Help us to be cheerful. Help us to give willing. Father, help us to give over and above because you gave over and above. Thank you for Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.
at some point in time, many of you have purchased a house. And if you have, you kind of know the ordeal that that can be. One of the processes in doing that sometimes is getting a house inspection where this professional comes in and takes a look at the house, makes sure that there's no major uh, problems with the house. Even though on the surface everything may look okay, it's possible that there could be flaws that lie underneath. In our text today, Jesus is going to draw an analogy between houses and lives. And he's going to remind us that whether you're talking about a house or whether you're talking about a life, taking a superficial look might not be enough. Join me today in Luke chapter 6, if you will, in your Bibles, or you can follow along on the screens as Jesus is going to close out his longest sermon with a very familiar story. There are two men in our story. They build almost identical houses, geographically close to each other, but there's one major difference. One of the men builds their house on the sandy shore, while the other man builds his house upon a rock. And this morning, as we go back and look at this familiar story, I want us to do so in the context that Jesus gives it. Because what he does here is he offers both a warning as well as a promise. Look with me, beginning in verse 43. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn brushes, nor grapes picked from bramble bushes. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. The evil person, out of the evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the floods arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been built, it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. What's the warning here? If you read back in the chapter, you'll notice that Jesus is speaking to the religious folks. And I think what the warning is, is this, that there are a lot of people who may think that they're right with God when they're really not. Now, now please note that Jesus is not talking about those uh, fragrant hypocrisy here. He, he's not talking about those that fake church on Sundays and live any way they want to during the week. His main audience is the Pharisees and the religious Jews. He's talking about sincere religious people who are self-deceived. And what he's going to show us in this text is what that self-deception looks like. The first thing that we see as a characteristic is their life bears no spiritual fruit. Look at verse 43 again. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. They say the right things. They may even go to the right places. But there's no real evidence of an encounter with Jesus. Does your heart have evidence of spiritual fruit? And the question is not whether or not we want to go to heaven. Because everyone wants to go to heaven, right? The question is whether God has worked enough in our life that he is all we want. You see, a real desire for God, and not just a desire to go to heaven when we die, is an evidence that God is working in us. 
and that spiritual fruit is taking place. A, a second characteristic here is that their life doesn't show any sign of this spiritual fruit. In verse 46, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? These religious folks had turned to Jesus for fire escape, for a, for a helper, for a religious model, but they've never fully surrendered their lives to him. And I wonder, could that happen to us? Could it be that we're coming to Jesus for the very same things that maybe they were coming to Jesus for, but yet there's not that full surrender of our life? What about our finances? Have we fully surrendered that to the Lord? What about our relationships? Have we fully surrendered that to God? What about our careers and our dreams? Have we fully surrendered that to God as well? Someone said this, he is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. A third characteristic of, of a self-deceived life is that, it's, that, that this faith falls apart when the storm comes. Look at verse 49, and but the one who hears and does not them is like a man who built a house on the ground without foundation. And when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. From a distance, these houses, both of them, they looked identical. They looked okay. What made the difference was when the storm came. When the storm came, it revealed the difference in the house. And, and the point is this, people's lives can look alike. They can attend the same church. They can believe the same thing. They can, they can live generally by the same morals. But one's faith is real and one is not. And the storm reveals that. You see, we love to talk about coming to Jesus as our, our fulfillment and our peace and our healing and our salvation, and he is all of those things. But what the storm reveals is whether or not we really have God in our hearts or whether or not we've just come to God expecting him to do certain things for our lives. In church, the difference between these two lives is not what they believed. The difference was, is how much their lives were actually built upon what they believed. And according to Jesus, your destiny is not determined necessarily by what you believe, but what your life demonstrates what you believe. So in our time left, let's consider some building blocks, if you will, to building a better life or one that will last. The first one is the reality of Jesus. Now, to help us with this, I want us to look back at Matthew's account of this story. Beginning verse 21 said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Now, understood the words says and does. What is it that they said? They said, Lord. They didn't just say it once. They said it twice. They must have really meant it. Not only is there zeal in their theology, but notice there's also zeal in their ministry. They prophesied. That means they preached in the name of Jesus. They cast out demons in the name of Jesus. They even did miracles in the name of Jesus. These are not people who, uh, you know, show up at the service late and leave early. These are folks that are on the varsity team. But look at verse 23. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's an interesting choice of phrases here that, that, that's used. To know someone in a biblical sense suggests an intimacy akin to marriage. And so Jesus is talking about a foundation that hinges upon really knowing him in an intimate, personal relationship not some surface relationship in such a way that he also in turn 
knows us. It's one thing to say, you know what, I know Jesus. But can it be said that Jesus knows you? And the latter is critical. There's a phrase in, in Luke's account that we read a moment ago that, that I think is very crucial because when he's talking about the wise man who built his house on the rock, he said this, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. There are a lot of people who have not dug very deep in their relationship with Jesus. They have just this surface relationship with Jesus where they manifest in their life certain habits and certain things and certain uh, attributes that would make you think that they really do know Jesus, and they, and they do. The problem is they haven't gone deep enough in that relationship so it could be said that Jesus reciprocates that knowing them. I love this illustration. I wish I had come up with it. I didn't. But suppose that you go to the grocery store today and you're going to buy a bag of dog food. And so you go get your bag of dog food and you go up and you get in the express line, you know, six items of less because you can count. A lot of people can't, but that, I won't go there. Okay? But you get in line and you got your one bag and so you're in line and, and they take the bag and they take the barcode on the bag, you know, the, the little thing that they scan and they scan the barcode and it rings up Blue Bell ice cream. Now, you know in your mind you don't have Blue Bell ice cream. You have a bag of dog food, but the barcode says bluebell ice cream. When we scan the barcode of our faith, what does it say? Baptized at 12 after the 12th verse of just as I am? Or five years ago, God really worked in my life? Or the preacher preached a sermon that, that really touched my heart? You see, sometimes our faith have all these little barcode things. And if you read the barcode, you're going to get all those things. It reads a lot like these folks in Matthew 7. They had done some really cool barcode things. The problem is, deep inside, what's really in the bag of your life? What's really there besides just what the barcode is saying? Do you really know Jesus? And John gives us the key. He says in 1 John 4, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Now, I, I don't have time to unpack all that that word confess means here. But it basically is talking about a surrender to his character and his authority. And so that's why Jesus said, those that build their house upon the rock, are the ones who, what, hear his word, keep his commandment, and do what he says to do. Because we've surrendered ourselves to his character and to his authority. We have dug deep. And to build your life, a one that's going to last, means that we have built it on the reality of Jesus. And here's the deal. The reality of Jesus and knowing that produces in us a life-changing result. And the second thing, as a building block we need to see, is, is that the stability of Jesus. If the first block's reality of him, the second block is the stability. There's a difference in the life of someone who's built their life on the rock and built their life on the sand, and as we mentioned other, other uh, earlier, oftentimes the storm brings that about. But the real change that we find there is the fact that Christ now lives in us. Look at First John chapter three. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Now that verse is not saying that if you're born of God, you're never going to sin again. But what that verse is saying is this, that those of us who have been born of God no longer enjoy sinning. The pleasures of sin don't mean what they used to mean to us. Because now we have the Holy Spirit in us, and it's like that check engine light in your car. It comes on when something just isn't quite right, okay? We've been changed. We've been transformed 
Our minds have been renewed and we are founded on the bedrock of Christianity. Now contrast that with the life of someone who builds their life on the sand. There's no reality of Jesus. There's no solid foundation. There's no stability. And so what happens? Their life crumbles. You see, despite our inconsistencies, the power for spiritual stability is ours in Christ. If we allow the knowledge of his will to control us. And the need for such stability is evidenced by the storms that we do face. A good foundation is essential for either a house or a life. Look at this picture. Several years ago, Hurricane Harvey hit the Gulf Coast. This is a picture that was taken. It was uh, circulated all over the place, the Internet and everywhere. If you'll notice, all the houses around this house were wiped out, destroyed. This one house is standing. They interviewed the guy who built this house. He said, I built the house with the storm in mind. I, I used 40-foot pylons. I built the walls where they would break away so when the winds came, there would be no structural damage that took place. Focus on that phrase, I built the house with the storm in mind. Folks, God has given us a foundation in Jesus Christ with all of the storms of life in mind. So when your struggle comes and when you fail and you fall his grace is sufficient and when you feel all alone his spirit is sufficient we have nothing left his mercy is sufficient the reality of Jesus the stability of Jesus that's what we build our life on that's going to make it and finally the eternity of Jesus. You see, folks, we're not just building a life for here. We're building a life forever. And I fear too oftentimes there are too many people in the body of Christ who do not approach life with eternal lens. They're only living for here. They're only living for the now. They're only living for next week. I heard a story about a young mother who went to have her yearly eye exam done. And much to her dismay, the doctor came in and told her that she had a very rare eye disease and it would be likely within the next five years that we, she would completely lose her sight. This is a lady in her mid-30s with four little children. And she realized that if the doctor's prediction is correct, then I will never see my kids graduate high school. And then she remembered a verse that she had read earlier that week. The words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 4. So we do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, and the things that are unseen are eternal. What's your foundation? Maybe a different way of asking that question is this. What if taken out of your life would make your life not worth living? Your family? Your paycheck? your health, your bank account. The truth of the matter is all these things that are seen can crumble. And the things that are unseen are eternal. And that's why Jesus came. That's why he died on a cross. He came to offer every single one of us eternal life and that's what we need to build our life upon so we close this morning we've all seen the golden gate bridge in san francisco we marvel at it it is 
one of the most important bridges there is out there because of the transportation that it provides in the Bay Area. If it wasn't there, they would have a serious problem. What you might not know is this. The bridge was actually built on a, on a fault line for an earthquake. And if earthquake happens, it's built in such a way that the middle span of that bridge can actually swing 20 feet either way and not crumble. Its flexibility is amazing, but its durability is even more amazing because it's all welded together, held together by these huge cables that are attached to these two towers. These two towers have anchor lines that run out to it, but these two towers have been built in a foundation of rock deep, below the water's level. It's that foundation that keeps the bridge from crumbling. What is your life built upon? What is it that will keep your life from crumbling? Is it the rock or is it the sand? That's the choice we have. That's what we must answer. Jesus Christ provides for us the stability that we need in our life. And he also provides for us the eternity that we all long for. But it's based upon the reality of whether or not we know him and he knows us. Today, if you need him in your life, while you decide, Let's stand and sing. I hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I bear my cross of fear and pain, but holy lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid right I stand, all of your ground is. Let's pray together before we leave, brethren. Heavenly Father, we thank you for <clears throat> this time for us all to be together. And as we feebly give you praise and glory, we are so built up and encouraged by the things that we do together to please you. And we 
pray, Father, that uh, as we go out into the world tomorrow to work, to school, wherever we might uh, have activities, that you would help us, Father, to do our best to show Jesus living in us to others and to always uh, measure our thoughts and our our activities by the things that uh, would be pleasing to you and to him. So help us, Father, and thank you for all these good things. In Jesus' blessed name we pray, and all the church said,